It's Saturday Night Live with Gabriel LaBelle, Rachel Sennett, Corey Michael Smith, Ella Hunt, Dylan O'Brien, Emily Farron, Finn Wolfhard, Willem Dafoe, Lamorne Morris, Matt Wood, Kim Motula, J.K. Simmons, and many more. With musical guest John Baptiste, written and directed by Jason Reitman and written by Gil Keenan. Live from a theater near you, it's Saturday Night, which, yes, is a look into how the debut episode of Saturday Night came together. It was written and directed by Jason Reitman, the son of Ivan Reitman, carrying on his father's legacy. Kinda, sorta, in the sense that he tries to be a filmmaker. That's unfair. Jason Reitman actually has done some good stuff. None of which have come out in the last couple of years, by the way. Ghostbusters Afterlife and Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. Yeah, Gil Keenan seems to be in lockstep with him, but on October 11th, 1975, we were going to see the debut episode of a live sketch comedy show with many, at the time, unknown people. And this show would help launch the careers of many comedians. Some would launch into the stratosphere, some would crash down to earth like John Belushi by basically his own doing. And yes, for those of you that were around when the debut episode of Saturday Night Live happened, this may hit some nostalgia vein for you. I was born six years at, well, just uh, about six years after this particular show debuted. And I do remember some of the stuff fondly from the early 90s, from the late 90s, into the early 2000s. By then, I was starting to get sick of Saturday Night Live. Going back to see some of the stuff from the 70s and even the early 80s, you, of course, had the Andy Kaufman stuff. Here I come to save the day! And this is basically a look back. There's the tracking shots. We see the backstage shenanigans and the issues as far as putting a live sketch comedy show together. Lorne Michaels, played by Gabriel LaBelle, who I do have to say uh, did a pretty good job here capturing the, you know, the wide-eyed, not necessarily innocence, but just it's going to work, it's going to work, it's going to work. But you can see behind his eyes, like, shit, fuck, everything's unraveling my dream. But... I do want to say that uh, as Lauren Michaels, Gabriel did a pretty good job, you know, as the figurehead. And you also have the stuff with Dick Ebersol. You do have Rachel Sennett as Rosie Schuster, who I have to say, Rachel Sennett, by the way, not only absolutely hilarious, she can play drama, she can play comedy, she was terrific in Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. She was astonishing in Bottoms. I still need to check out I Used to Be Funny. She's great. She's also fucking gorgeous. She's just captivating to look at on screen, but she's also really funny. She does a pretty good job here as Rosie, but the standout is Corey Michael Smith as Chevy Chase. Honest to God, I actually thought it was a DH Chevy Chase. That's how great Corey Michael Smith was. This is a show stopper of a fucking performance by him. Get this man in more projects. Have him name his goddamn price. Because whenever he was on screen, I was absolutely locked in. Now, as far as, you know... My feelings on this particular movie, I'll get to that in a bit. As far as seeing the trailer, I thought, okay, it looks fine. This is kind of a neat little time capsule. Neat little dive into nostalgia. And they're not going to be able to cover every single thing, but they're going to cover some of the high points. And then you have others. You have J.K. Simmons um, in a uh, nice little cameo role. You have Willem Dafoe, who seemingly isn't everything now. I mean, he was in Kinds of Kindness. He was in Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. He's in this. Um... Honest to God, Willem Dafoe, great on him being in so many movies. It was also an Inside, which I guess played to his strengths in the sense he was pretty much the only person that was there trying to act and act his way out of a almost a literal paper bag. Inst instead, it was actually an apartment. But you do have Finn Wolfhard, who his role was kind of reduced <coughs> um, for a guy to spend in quite a few projects. But yes, as far as the theme of this whole thing, there is a line said later in the movie, art is a measure of sacrifice and tears. And there are a lot of forces working against Lorne Michaels as he's trying to get this stuff together. There's a lot of infighting. There's the stuff with Chevy Chase and John Bellucci. Read up on that. I'm not going to try to go deep into all this stuff because one, not exactly in my entire wheelhouse, but also it would be such a divergent path, such like, you know, an offshoot. That's better if you just read up about it. <clears throat> but for those that like little Easter eggs, there are a few in here. There are a few neat little moments, a few decent laughs, mainly thanks to Rachel Sennett and Corey Michael Smith. Though I do want to say, <clears throat> Lamorne um, Morris does have a chance to like actually shine a little bit a couple times. There are brief flashes of comedic brilliance. 
Now, however, the problem is, is for every single joke that lands, and there are some that land, everything else is scattershot. I mean, there are some that land, eh, and then there are some that land with a resounding thud. And while this is more docu-series style, kind of showing what's going on, and there's a breezy nature about it, it also feels a little tonally inconsistent and almost a little bit unnecessary. Like this maybe should have been like a four-part series where we could have dived or dove into the rest of all this stuff. Because you get little flashes of stuff. You get the relationship between Lauren and Rosie. I do have to say that, you know, everybody plays their roles well when they're allowed to do stuff. And yes, maybe the idea is sketch comedy. Some things have to be cut. And that's kind of the thing, like, you know, what we're seeing backstage and some stuff that had to be cut down to do this 90-minute live broadcast that was during the time when NBC was having, you know, a dispute, so to speak, with Johnny Carson. And that's a whole nother divergent path that could be taken. But Johnny Carson, the king of late night, somebody that, even though I obviously was not alive for pretty much most of his heyday, <clears throat> I mean, he did step down, I think, around the time when I was 10 or 11. I think he stepped down sometime in 91, 92. Johnny Carson is the king of late night, in my personal opinion, and got away with a whole bunch of stuff. I love the stuff they did when they went to the audience and he would just make up stories about them. It does capture the 70s aesthetic pretty well, and the trials and tribulations of some of these actors and some of these people wanting to basically sink their teeth into some of these roles and do good things. It's not an awful movie. It's just a scatterbrained one, and one that I feel just... It felt unnecessary while Corey Michael Smith and Rachel Sennett and Gabriel LaBelle to an extension were, you know, basically the standouts. Now, again, there are some good ones. The guy who played Andy Kaufman was pretty good as well when he was allowed to do something, but he was just kind of there. It's a fine movie for what it is. More people that were around for this time period might get into it. Or, uh, you know, on the other hand, some people that basically felt like, oh, this is going to be something that's going to remind me of my childhood. Some people might feel this is just a surface level look at it. And it, it kind of is because I don't expect them to go way too deep into a bunch of stuff. But yeah, J.K. Simmons has a couple standout scenes. Um, Brad Garrett has a brief cameo. There are some neat little things about how Lauren Michaels is able to bring this stuff together. Um, but read up on the stuff with Lauren Michaels and Dick Ebersole as far as Dick Ebersole trying to strong arm his way into basically, you know, becoming the king of NBC, shall we say. It is what it is, but once again, Corey Michael Smith is absolutely fucking astonishing. Just tremendous as Chevy Chase. Really sunk his mind, body, and soul into that. Looked and sounded just like him. Carried himself like him without pissing off all his co-workers. It read up on Chevy Chase and know what I'm talking about. Yeah, Rachel Sennett, bright, hilarious, beautiful. Shine whenever she was on there. <clears throat> but other issues pop up, like the fact that it just, I don't know, it just felt... It didn't feel fully shaped, and while, yes, it had a breezy nature about it, <clears throat> I did like that they were reminding us of the time codes of how long that the movie had left, like until showtime, because then they gave us an indication it was eventually going to end, because it started to get a little bit tedious. Nevertheless, this is in theaters if you want to check it out, so there you go. SNL fans, check it out. 3, 2, 1, spoilers. Um, there's really not a lot to spoil here. It did show John Belushi being a cokehead. Some stuff between uh, Chevy, uh, Chevy Shafe. Chevy Chase, Shashish, Susu Studio. Oh, all right, all right. But yeah, between Chevy Chase and John Belushi. Um, I did like Ella Hunt as Gilda Radner. I kind of wish it would have given her more to do. Um, Dylan O'Brien was terrific as Dan Aykroyd. But, and Emily Farron, I really think, could have had, you know, more of a chance to, like, you know, sink her teeth in the, her role. It, but nevertheless, it was what it was. The music was fine. The aesthetic, the fact that it was difficult to get all these sets done, and it really it was just down to nut cutting time, as many people say. J.K. Simmons does play Milton Burl. I, I did get a kick out of that. He actually <clears throat> did some great stuff, including hitting on uh, Chevy Chase's girlfriend, which you may recognize her. <clears throat> if I recall correctly, it was Olivia, the woman that played Olivia in Scream 4. I never said I was in your closet, which is just a great scene. One of my favorite deaths. Let's fucking go. So it is It is good at times. But overall, the presentation kind of drags it down into just decent territory. Because if they had focused on the positives and kind of shied away from some of the negatives, I would have actually been okay with it. But yeah, it's an 
it's an uneven, half-cooked thing overall. With, again, Corey Michael Smith and Rachel Zinn doing pretty well. And it does <clears throat> shine a light on how difficult television like this is to do. And it is kind of funny that Lorne Michaels was able to meet his, you know, the, the main writer, or at least one of his main writers, at a goddamn bar writing uh, bad, or writing stand-up jokes for a guy. And he hired him last goddamn minute and then pulled somebody from another sound stage to help do some stuff. There were lighting rigs falling, <coughs> all the stuff happening. I don't know about the John Belushi uh, ice skating thing, but whatever. We can, I mean, I could believe him diving in face first in the fresh powder because it's what he did. But, yeah, it was what it was. It's all right. It's just... It's just not as good as it could have been, and I didn't expect it to be like this landmark, like, life-changing movie. But it just felt like they just wasted some of the potential they had had. And, of course, the show goes off, not necessarily without a hitch. Obviously, there were issues, but it led to so many iconic segments, weekend updates, <coughs> and various others. And I did like the Andy Kaufman guy, you know, doing, you know, Here I Come to Save the Day. That was pretty good. Willem Dafoe was nice as a slimy executive. And... Again, it was what it was. It wasn't necessarily something that... It's not necessarily something you can spoil because there isn't a lot to sink your teeth into like beyond the concept and beyond a couple of the performances I mentioned. So nevertheless, the show goes off and you know SNL has continued to make history since. It's had ups and downs all around. Come on, defense work. But in closing, Corey Michael Smith, Rachel Sand, um, Gabriella Bell, <clears throat> they did good. It was it was serviceable, but it wasn't necessarily great. I'm going to give it a C plus for the positives, but I found myself liking it less and less when, you know, my favorite parts weren't on there. And for all the cast that, you know, tried and for the loaded cast that it had, it just felt like it just didn't quite know what it wanted to be. And that's what eventually drags it down into just decent territory. So yeah, C plus. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Like, share, subscribe, Twitter handle in the description. I'm John Ripplin. I'll see you soon.